It's uh, Thursday morning, 11 o'clock, the 30th of August. We'll now return to our study of the law in Galatians and we're busy at the moment with the present, or coming up to the presentation of the law upon Mount Sinai. We've found that the Israelites came down to the Red Sea and crossed it and wandered onto the desert, being blessed by some very marvellous manifestations of God's love and presence and leadership. But they, even though they had all these things, they were old covenant believers and lacked the blessing of true salvation from sin. I'll read again this little paragraph which says that they had, living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, they had no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law, and their need of a saviour. All this they must be taught. Now let's see how God went about teaching them these things. The next paragraph says, God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them his law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. I want now to relate this to the Roman 7 picture. Up until Mount Sinai, they were without the law, but when they came to Sinai, just, we just draw the mountain here sort of this is where the law entered as Paul says in Romans the 7th chapter so back here literally they, they were without the law and therefore they were willing sinners as we read in the uh, in Wagner's book on the book of Romans and when they came to Sinai God gave them his law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you, sh then you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now many people have misread God's statement in this particular verse. Most folk have said, well, our task is to look at that law, see in it the model for our behaviour, diligently refrain from what that law condemns and then we shall be unto God a peculiar people. But that is a most mistaken uh, concept altogether, um, a concept which leads to two things, a Romans 7 experience and at the same time an old covenant experience in which the person does not achieve righteousness as it is in Jesus. All right, let's, let's come back and note the words then. If you will obey my voice indeed. Now is it possible to obey God's voice if we're not first of all a born again Christian? That's impossible. The law is kept from an inward condition not from simply making a dedication of ourselves to obey its command, its or to cease from doing what it condemns. Now, I read, I read a little further. The people did not realise the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ it was impossible for them to, to keep God's law and they readily entered into covenant with God. Now think today when you first became a Seventh-day Adventist or a religionist of any kind and you were brought face to face as you are in the Seventh-day Adventist organisation with the need to obey the Ten Commandments and obedience of course means largely refraining from doing certain things. Thou shalt not commit adultery. They shall not steal. They shall not bear false witness. They shall not break the Sabbath day. And so it goes through. Now when you made your pledge of obedience to, at your baptism for instance, did you realise the sinfulness of your own heart? No, we didn't, did we? There was information that we didn't understand back in those days. Did we realise that without Christ it was impossible to keep God's commandments and again the answer is strictly speaking no now again this sentence, this sentence is often misread it says the people did not realise that without Christ it was impossible for them to keep God's law now with Christ is understood in the following terms by many many people let me just uh, very briefly present a study here which we've had before. I'll, I'll, I'll do this in, in very brief form. We have three elements um, in the makeup of our humanity. We have, first of all, a body. 
Secondly, we have a mind, by which I mean the intellect. And thirdly, we have a spirit, which is otherwise called the carnal mind, but this is the spirit of evil in the person. So we have physical, mental and spiritual. Now the first point of access that God has to us is for the mind and he presents to us information as, and, and as we receive the information we are learning. I should perhaps, perhaps I should first of all say we hear. We hear and see, that's the first thing. And by what we hear we learn and from what we learn we reason and then we set the will to uh, some life pattern or the other according to the theology or philosophy to which we have been subjected and which we, which we have accepted. Your philosophy may, if, if, it's, if it's a certain kind, make you a terrorist or make you a religionist as the case may be. Now over here we have the indwelling presence of the spirit of disobedience, the spirit of hate, the spirit of pride and so forth and so on. Now, <clears throat> we're going to imagine a man who is a church member who has in him still the spirit of hatred and pride a man who takes offence very easily when, when attacked by slander or accusations or condemnation and let's suppose that, they, that, that this man's hatred has, has been developed toward one person in particular whom we shall call the enemy now this man goes to church one day and he hears the preacher say or read love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you and the man says to himself I've got to admit I don't love my enemy he's at least that honest then he reasons and says now the fact that I don't love my enemy means that if I face the judgment today I certainly wouldn't go to heaven because I, if I hate him I'm a murderer the Bible says that so this man, because he wants to go to heaven, is motivated by, uh, and because he doesn't want to be a hater either, he's reasonably sincere. If the only motiv motivation for righteousness is the reward of heaven, it's not good enough. We, we must hate sin for sin's sake, not just to get a reward at the end of the road. And this man makes a decision. He says, all right, from this time on, I'm going to love my enemy with all my heart and with all my soul. And that's a very, very commendable resolution but it's no different from that made by Israel when they said all that God hath command will we do and be obedient and the scripture for that of course as quoted here in Patriarchs and Prophecies uh, Exodus 24 and verse 7 all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient Exodus 24 and verse 7 so this man now is reaching out by the power of his will to work the works of righteousness but remember he still has in him the spirit of hatred. Just as the Israelites back there did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts, they didn't understand that their real problem was not what they did, but what they were inside themselves. Now, inevitably, just so long as the spirit of hatred remains in you, what's going to happen to some time or the other? It'll flare up. When your enemy crosses your pathway again and says things to you which are not... Uh, complimentary or um, praiseworthy then you are stirred up and uh, there comes boiling up from within this, this flood tide of anger, resentment and so forth so we find now that we have a warfare in our hands the power of sin versus the power of the will so let's put the word will here but the full expression is the power of the will is now being exerted in an upward direction and the power of sin is being exerted in a downward direction and which of the two of course is the more powerful and the answer is the power of sin if you haven't learned that you've never fought against sin ever anyone who has fought against sin knows that it is by far the more powerful of the two forces now at this point as this flood tide of evil comes boiling up from within the man remembers his covenant with God and with all his might and man he tries to push that evil thing back down where it came from to control it to suppress it, to subdue it. That's the response that is so common from human beings. And you know what I'm talking about, I know, because you've all been down this road, have you not? You've all tried it that way without success. And as you're pushing this evil thing down, you're very, very well aware of the fact that your pitiful human weakness is inadequate to control and suppress this wicked evil power called the power of sin, the boiling flood tide of hate which is filling your entire, entire being. And so, what do you do? 
knowing that the power of God is greater than the power of sin, you cry out and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Now, you're doing something. Now, for instance, if I see you carrying a heavy table across the yard or trying to carry a heavy table and, you, 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 and I'm passing by and you say, help me, what, what am I supposed to do? To assist you to do what you're doing. Okay, not something different but what you're doing. So if I'm pushing this evil thing back or trying to push this evil thing back where it came from and I say, Lord, help me, what am I asking him to do? Right, to help me push it back where it came from. To co-work with me in what I'm doing. Okay, so now we have a situation where we have God's power supposedly added to our power so that these two combined, God plus me, will get the victory over the sin by pushing that thing back where it came from. And I think if you think carefully, that is the, that, that is the common approach made by people who have not yet learned the principles of this message. That when that kind of person, following that kind of procedure, reads a statement like this, where it says, and that without Christ it was impossible for them to keep God's law, then that's the picture they see, isn't it? That's the picture they see. Now remember a few years ago I read to you that statement from uh, the book entitled Through Crisis to Victory where Butler was quoted as preaching justification by faith in clear positive language as page 45 and 46 of the book entitled uh, Through Crisis to Victory. And um, Butler's position was that Christ's strength imparted to Paul through faith gave him victory over his besetments. A little further down it says... Um, we're not to be satisfied with our own efforts to keep the law without the help of Christ's Spirit. In other words, that picture, it is said, will never work, but that one will. So they say. But it doesn't work, and here's some, some reasons why. Number one, it uh, takes God out of his rightful place and puts him in a different place altogether. Because if I say, to, to, if I'm doing the work, if I'm trying to push this thing back and I say, Lord, help me then into what role of, is God now cast by this theology as being a mere helper or assistant? That's all. So he's only a helper to the Saviour and who becomes the Saviour if this theology is correct? We do. We do. And that's made, that, 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 that theology then makes man to be what? God. Because if man becomes the Saviour and God's the assistant Saviour, then who's the more important person of the two? Man is... So man is, 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 is exalted above God and the exaltation of man above God of course is the papal principle where man takes the place of God and actually rules over God. So this is, this is as Babylonian the theology, theology as can be found anywhere in the world. Now, as I said a moment ago, of course we know, we know we must do and the second reason is this of course it is not God's way to push that thing back where it came from. God's only uh, solution or procedure with the evil spirit of hatred is to root that thing out and replace it with the spirit of love. God has no other way of working and there's no other way which will work anyway. The same as in the garden. The gardener is always careful to root out the weeds and thorns and thistles and, and uh, thorn bushes and so forth and replace them with the good plant. So I want, I want us not to miss the point that when the average uh, old covenant believer or, or member or disciple reads the words the people did not realise the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ it was impossible for them to keep God's law that is what they're thinking about now we know of course that uh, that's no solution that just as out in the um, if we just re reproduce in, this in the garden here is the thorn bush here is the gardener look, looking at his problem he's got his chip hoe in his hands and he says now what shall I do now this gardener has a thorn bush and he wants apples. This man over here has a heart of hatred. He wants to manifest love. They both want good fruit, but they both want it from an evil tree. Therefore, this situation in the spiritual realm is identical to this situation back in the garden. Now if this gardener was to carefully irrigate and fertilize that tree, prune it and so forth and cut all the thorns off, he might end up with a thornless thorn bush, but he has a thorn bush still, doesn't he? And he'll not get apples. There's no way in the world he'll get apples. Now the gardener recognises it is pointless and fruitless to kneel down and say, Lord, help me to 
bring forth apples on this on this thorn bush he knows there's no sense in that but isn't that what this man over here is trying to do absolutely and I'm, I'm amazed that uh, good sensible farmers and gardeners will do the right thing in their garden and the wrong thing in their knees it's incredible there's only one solution that's to root this tree out by the roots and replace it with the apple seedling and in due time the apple grows up of course becomes a nice big apple tree and when it does then at last you get apples first the apple tree then the apples so then coming back to our study in, from, from the book Patriarchs and Prophets we now understand how folk misread these verses or statements when they say the people did not realise the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ it was impossible for them to keep God's law and they readily entered into covenant with God in, right now let's come back then to our Romans 7 diagram over here which we'll, now, which we'll now pick up again when the Romans 7 man not realizing the sinfulness, sinfulness of his own nature recognizes the requirements of the law he says yes I will obey that law and he tries what's the result failure tries again fails again tries again fails again and so it goes on until finally he comes face to face with the new covenant we know that back here he was a willing sinner now he's an unwilling sinner but very much a sinner still whether willing or unwilling the only question is are you sinning that's the important point and sinners willing or unwilling just simply don't go to heaven coming back now to patriarchs and prophets we read they had witnessed the proclamation of the law in awful majesty and had trembled with terror before the mount and yet only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image they could not hope for the favour of God for a covenant which they had broken and now seeing their sinfulness and the need of pardon they were brought to feel their need of the Saviour revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and foreshadowed and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings now by faith and love they were bound to God as they delivered from the bondage of sin now they are prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant the terms of the old covenant were obey and live if a man do he shall even live in them but cursed be that he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them Deuteronomy 27 verse 26 right let's come back now and look at this picture again at Mount Sinai the first thing that God had to do was to bring to those people a picture of themselves they had, that is always the first work that God has to do in our morning worship study periods we are learning from the study of the woman at the well that Jesus Christ brought to her a personal conviction of sin she came to see herself as she was and seeing herself as she was she was then led to reach out and lay hold upon God's solution for that problem so when God gave the Israelites the two tables of stone he gave them a picture of themselves now let's see let's, let's, let's compare the two and um, we'll place this on the board this morning so we can see it more plainly but we'll take first of all the two tables of stone as they're commonly drawn of course like this and then there was the the Ten Commandments written on both sides right down, down on the plain of course for the people looking up as, as God gave, gave the law to Moses now what kind of hearts did those people have at that point of time according to Ezekiel 36 26 they had stony hearts right they had stony hearts and as they heard the words of the law then upon their minds were written the, the letters of that law which says thou shalt not thou shalt not thou shalt not and so forth now we can draw another picture here and this is the table of stone upon which nothing was written as you remember first of all God produced the tables of stone and, and when he finished the tables he then wrote upon them the words of the law is that also a picture of people? certainly are there not today millions upon millions of people who have stony hearts who know nothing about God's law? surely there are and they're uh, symbolized or represented by the two tables of stone upon which nothing is written of course we can't truly say that nothing of God's law is written upon any man's heart because because they do have some concepts of right and wrong of justice and injustice 
So in every man's heart there is something of God's law written, but not in the detail and to the extent it's written in the minds of those who studied God's word and professed to be Christians. So then, first of all, the two tables were there with no law written upon them, and then it was there with the law written upon them, and that symbolizes those people who profess to be God's children, who understand what the letter of the law says, it's written upon them, upon their stony hearts and they're, and they're controlled by that law to a large extent that control of course being the bondage of the law there is the bondage to sin which is one bondage and the bondage to the law which is another bondage and the bondage to Christ which is another bondage again because the bondage to Christ is really perfect freedom now then what God desired the children of Israel to see was in that law a picture of themselves but not a model of what they were to be. Now, if those two tables of stone are a model of what Christians are to be, then between Sinai, back to creation, they had no model. Did they? You ever think about that? That's quite right. They had no model. They had the law, but not, not in that form. Not, not written upon two tables of stone, as was given then upon Mount Sinai, and, and they never would have had that model if, as you read from Patriarchs and Proverbs, page 364, they had obeyed the principles of righteousness from the very beginning as kept by Adam and Abraham. Who is the Christian's model? Christ is the model. And what is the purpose of those two tables of stone? To be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Jesus Christ. Now, if we go right back to the original... Um, situation in the Garden of Eden we find that um, let this line represent the point when the fall took place here's the fall at this point of time now before that we find we have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and in them was the spirit of obedience at that point of time and at that point of time there was no written law at all in fact um, when the issues of the great controversy surfaced and uh, the law was brought out the angels were surprised to find that there had been a law because prior to that time they had obeyed because it was in them to obey they had the spirit of obedience and did not need to be told at any time thou shalt not that was completely unnecessary back up in heaven and can you imagine for instance that when we get to heaven we're going to have a whole lot of signs around thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie and so forth. Heaven would be a rather unfortunate place if that was necessary. Now when we know of course God gave to Adam and Eve life, a home, powers and the law as a means of controlling and using those powers successfully. And the warning of course if they broke that law then they bring upon themselves a situation of disaster. Now they broke that law, that is the law of love, and by the way, of course, you might mention that um, implicitly in the Garden of Eden the Ten Commandments were present and that Eve specifically broke every one of those ten prohibitions when she sinned against God by taking that fruit. Let's just briefly look at them. Number one, she first of all believed Satan's lie so she became a little later a, a bearer of false witness to, to her husband and he in turn became a bearer of false witness too. Then she led to covet the fruit, she stole the fruit, she ate of it and, there, and thereby became the murderer of every person ever born, including the Son of God, because death entered because of her sin. She dishonoured her heavenly father and she committed spiritual adultery, as, as we can read in Jeremiah the third chapter. So there, there's all six of the second side broken in just a few seconds by Eve. She took another God in the place of the real God, the piece of fruit became a graven image that she lusted after him. She took God's name in vain and she broke the Sabbath rest principle. So every command was broken, every one, even though it was not written out in a series of thou shalt nots. Now the moment that they broke those ten, the moment that they sinned in the Garden of Eden and disobeyed God's commandments, then another spirit entered into them. And this, this is a very important factor in the whole drama. Another spirit. And that was the spirit of disobedience. The desire to do the wrong thing in preface to the right thing. 
And all of us know about that, especially if you think back in your childhood days and your parents said, do this, and you said, I don't want to do that, and I want to do this something else over here. And very often this led to a conflict between parent and child in which the child very often was the winner, more often than not these days. Back in the old days, fathers were a bit more heavy-handed and uh, mothers were more strict and children didn't get away what they get away with today, but um, and that was better in some respects. Now, when this other spirit entered into man, then it became necessary to restrain that man from manifesting that spirit and carrying out what he wanted to do. And that, of course, is the purpose of all thou shalt not laws. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 to, make, to, to see where Paul makes his point in very clear terms. 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> a text that the Protestants love to use, too, by the way. But a, a very truthful text to say the least of it. Let's take verses uh, 8, 9, 10, 11. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them who defile themselves of mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing which is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Now what law is Paul referring to? The moral law. It is not made for a righteous man. He doesn't need it. And let me demonstrate that the righteous man doesn't need it. Now we'll take first of all a man in whom is the actual presence of God's love. The love of God is in this man. So he loves as God loves. He just, and, and let me stress again that word as he loves as God loves and this man finds in himself if he, begins, if he cares to examine himself he'll find that he literally actually loves his worst enemy that he's spending his time praying for his enemy that he's, that he, that he's returning good for evil that, he's, that his one consuming desire is to, is to bless his enemy and prosper him rather than destroy or cut him down now, if a man is so preoccupied with, with the love of God uh, surging through his whole being, does that man need to be told, thou shalt not kill him? Not at all. Just unnecessary. And if, again, a person has a, an inbuilt respect for another person's property, for his wife, his house, his land, his money, his possessions, his time, his, 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 his rights of freedom, and so forth, so he has a profound respect for all of his neighbours. Does that man need to be told, Thou shalt not steal? Thou shalt not steal? Of course not. How many of you, how many of you folk have I had to remind, please don't smoke in this room? Not one of you. Why not? Because it's not in you to smoke. We don't even have a no smoking sign, do we? There, there is. There are some in the other building over there in the dining room, but not here. But the sign, that sign didn't affect your behaviour, did it? Not in the least, because it, there's no disposition in you to smoke. And the only kind of citizens, citizens that God wants up in heaven are the kind of people in whom is built the principle of right, righteousness. So we do right because this is our disposition, this is our spirit, this is our nature. And not one of us should rest satisfied until there has been eliminated from our very systems the disposition to do wrong. We, we, we must come to the place where our only disposition is to naturally do right as is shown in the life of Jesus Christ and when Christ was upon this earth for instance with his pure and perfect character do you suppose that he kept saying to himself now the law says don't do this and don't do that the law says don't kill your enemies so I shan't kill the Pharisees I love to but I won't do it anyway was that Christ's uh, way of doing things not for one moment he loved them so intensely he so passionately longed to bring them salvation he didn't even feel their insults. He didn't even feel their hatred. All he, all he felt like doing was reaching out and saving them in his great arms of compassion and love. But once this other spirit entered into mankind, then God had two choices. One, he could have simply left mankind uncontrolled to live out the passions of his evil nature and what would, what would soon have happened to the human race. He would have self-destructed, right? self-destructed 
Now today in Canada, USA, South America, Australia, every country upon the face of the earth has its laws and policemen to enforce those laws. Now supposing, as, as, as happened in Montreal a few years ago, the police all went on strike or were sacked and the whole system was, was done away with, so there, was no one, there were no law enforcers to force men to obey against their own natures, what would we soon see the earth plunged into? Anarchy and ruin. In fact, when the police uh, went on strike in Montreal about, I think about six years ago now, for about two weeks, I forget how long, but it was a few days anyway, uh, all the, the crime just exploded, they say. There was looting, there was shop windows being broken, there was murders and thefts and rapes and, and so on. It was, it was a reign of terror out in that, in that big city. So therefore, the first and most basic purpose of that law is to restrain evil men from doing what they are disposed to do. It's a bondage, it chains them up. And of course, when you uh, find religions like, like Reformed churches, and, legal, and pharisaical legalistic bodies you find that people motivated by the prospect of reward they say right now if I obey that law I'm going to get heaven golden streets and pearly gates and eternal life and so forth and so in reformed church organizations the whole emphasis is on the strictest possible obedience the, the, the controlling of every passion and every emotion and every desire so it conforms to what the law says thou shalt not do and, and people, people have to suppress and fight against their own natural dispositions in order to do that, but because the motivational reward is so strong, they do do it and, and actually achieve remarkable success in doing it. Now, usually you'll notice that the children reined up so tightly during the early years, when those, when those children come to be teenagers, what do they do? They really break out, don't they? And they go quite often to the opposite extreme. And that tight, legalistic, restrictive law is extremely bad for the up, in the upbringing of children. Right then. But that's not the only purpose of that law. It was added because of transgressions for another purpose as well. So we put down, first of all, restraining or restraint. But then at, there's another purpose. That, that is the purpose of schoolmaster. And this, of course, is the important purpose so far as we're concerned. And the schoolmaster is to lead us to who? It's to lead us to Jesus Christ. For what purpose? To put into us the spirit of life, the spirit of regeneration, the spirit of grace, so that we have another, we have now the original disposition, or the original spirit, put that word instead, and the original spirit, of course, is the spirit of obedience. And this is symbolized not by two tables, and this back here, of course, is symbolized by two tables of stone here but what is it symbolized by over here fleshy tables of the heart stone is dead the heart is living stone is unproductive the heart is highly productive stone is used for defensive walls and bastions and fortresses and so forth to keep to keep to keep the place enclosed and but the heart of course is open to the bonds of love and so forth now let's go back to second corinthians chapter 3 for a moment to see how Paul pursues his argument along the way. We've read in verse, um, perhaps we can read verse 3 again. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone but in the fleshly table, fleshy tables of the heart. Now Paul says you are not tables of stone in which the letter of the law is written and I thank God you're not. You are living tables of the heart upon which the Spirit of God has written the divine principles. Now verse 4 goes on to say, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now Paul was a man divinely called to his mission and like Jeremiah, God gave him the message he was to bear and Paul says, God never called me to be a minister of the letter of the law. Never. But he called me to be a minister of the spirit of the law. Why? Because the letter kills but the spirit gives life. Look at verse 7 which goes on to say, Now if the ministration of death 
written and engraven in stones was glorious. Now what is administration? It's called the administration of death. Administration is a service, is it not? And when, uh, an administration of death serves what? It serves death. What is the end result of administration of death? Death. If you administer life, you get life. If you administer justice, you get justice. If you administer death, you get death. Now what is the administration of death? That which was written and engraved in stones. And what was written and engraved in stones? The Ten Commandments, the law given to Moses upon Mount Sinai. Now that is described as being a ministration of death. Now, I remember when I was a boy in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that they all, what they usually had in the various churches, up behind the speaker's desk, up on the wall up here, they had a drawing of the Ten Commandments and there was the law written out in full. And we were admonished to study that law and make it to be the model that we patterned our lives after. And we worked at that and the more we did, the deader we became, the more spiritually lifeless we became, the more miserable, miserable, miserable we became, and the more our minds were stunted and dwarfed by that practice. Because the preacher entirely missed the point of that law, he failed to see his administration of death. And anyone, it's because the stone is dead, that symbolises the death element of it, and anyone who patterns his life after a dead, cold thing, which the thou shalt not laws are, is, is the subject of administration of death. And that's why Sister Wise said back in 1880 or thereabouts, we have preached the law until we are dry as the hills of Gilboa without, without, with neither dew nor rain. And that hill was a desert in the worst possible kind of way. It was just rocks, strewn with rocks, nothing grew there, hardly even cactus grew there. It was totally unproductive. And she said, we preach the law until we become as dry as the hills of Gilboa without dew or rain. Now, instead, God gave that law as a schoolmaster to be a picture to us of what we actually were, lifeless and incapable of production, so we'll be driven to the life giver who would then implant the original spirit back in us again and having the original spirit of love and joy and so forth, we could then obey the principles of righteousness which are the eternal principles. The law in this form, two tables of stone, was added because of transgression and all thou shalt not laws are added because of transgression. If you study the laws made in this country, the United States of America, in your state or province as the case may be, you'll find that first of all there arises a problem because men are living out their unsanctified hearts and lives. For instance, take... Um, well, no smoking. Was there ever a no smoking sign before folk began to smoke and there were other people? There never was. First of all, people thoughtlessly um, and discourteously began to smoke in other people's living rooms and trains, on buses, on ships and the non-smoker was thoroughly irritated by the discourteous behaviour of the smoker. So, to solve the problem, what do they introduce? A thou shalt not law, right? Take, for instance, um, the traffic laws which say you can't travel any, any higher than a certain speed in the open highway. Now, people are getting killed, maimed, injured and so forth. Property was being damaged, so they introduced a law to, to solve them. Thou shalt not drive at any more than a certain speed. Not that we think they're too sensible, some of those laws. They're written by... Of course, men's laws are not always very sensible anyway. They're very uh, partial and uh, unjust and oppressive at times. If you like to list all the thou shalt not laws you find in the laws of the land, you find that first of all came the transgression and then came the law, right? Every time. Now, if the transgression was to cease, supposing every person on the face of the earth was to stop smoking, no more smokers anyway, very sensible idea actually, what would happen to all of those smoking signs? They'd disappear, right? They would disappear. Now, have you got the point? In other words, if the spirit of smoking disappeared from the earth, so would the thou shalt not law. It would cease to exist anymore. So likewise, when the spirit of disobedience is, is taken out of us, when we come back to Jesus Christ, then what happens to the thou shalt not law as far as the Christian is concerned? It disappears. And that's what Paul meant in Galatians 3.19 when he said, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression. To do what? 
to restrain those in whom was a disposition to do the evil thing and also to be our schoolmaster to bring us back to Jesus Christ until the seed should come. And who is the seed? Jesus Christ. Now I don't equate the coming of the seed to Calvary excepting as Calvary becomes my experience. In other words, for the person who has not yet come to Calvary, the person in whom is still the old spirit of disobedience, the, spirit, the person who has not yet received the seed of Christ is still under the schoolmaster or under the bondage of the old thou shalt not law. But when that point of time comes that we come to Jesus Christ and the seed becomes ours, our, our experience, then the old thou shalt not law passes away. The bondage to the law is gone together with the bondage to sin and we're now free men and women in Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul said in Galatians, the fifth chapter and verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now the Galatians, of course, have been delivered from the bondage of the law and from the bondage of sin. They had been the subjects of Paul's ministry and had been saved from that uh, problem, but they'd gone back again to the old bondage of sin and the old bondage of the law. And that's why Paul asked them the question in Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verse 21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So there are some who, who desire to be under the law. There are some people to whom the religion of thou shalt not is attractive. It seems to be the best they're capable of appreciating and understanding. And so desire to go back under that bond. But Paul says, uh, Paul details the in inadvisability of that in Galatians 4 verses 20 down to verse 31. We don't have time to look at it, to look at that at this present moment. And so once a person becomes born again, he now has an altogether different relationship toward the law than that which he had before he's a born again Christian. Before, before he's a born again Christian, the law restrains him from doing what he's, what he is disposed to do, what, he's, what, he, what his nature calls upon him to do. After he's born again, then the law, uh, that old vassal not, not law is done away with now, and now Jesus Christ becomes his example, and he lives out his natural disposition, just as the thorn bush, I mean the rose bush produces roses, and the fig tree produces figs, so it's natural for the converted man to work the works of righteousness. And that's the kind of experience, of course, which we all must have if we plan to enter the heavenly courts in the near future. So have a little at that point as our time is now gone and uh, we'll pick up the steam again when we meet, meet this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Any questions you'd like to ask up until this point? Yes, David. Yeah, what does it mean when it talks about David meditating in the law day and night and making it with his life? Right. Uh, remember I said that back, back here in the Garden of Eden God gave Adam and Eve um, life, a home, power and law. We can't, we, can't, we can't live without law, that's impossible. Every facet of our life is controlled by law. When you drive your car, fly an aeroplane, uh, the laws of your health, the laws of your body, everything is governed by law. But when we meditate upon the law of God as God gave it, we're meditating upon principles to live by, not principles of restraint, not principles of, of um, control, or bondage and so forth. And when David meditated upon the law of God, he wasn't meditating upon the thou shalt not law, but meditating upon the great principles of righteousness, the, the laws of life by which we live. Now, for instance, when a person learns to, uh, shall we say, fly an aeroplane, he has to a lot of, spend a lot of time studying the laws of flight. And saying those laws, he's not saying a lot of thou shalt not, he's saying a lot of do's of things that you do in order to maintain safe and successful flying. And you learn to look upon the, um, the law as a friend, not as, a, as, as an enemy that's stopping you from doing what you want to do, but someone who's enabled you to do what you do want to do. Can a person then expect to see the fruits of what the law requires in their life? Yes, yeah, certainly, but of course, care must be taken here not to, go, not to judge another person because, um, especially if we have a background, um, if we have a background in legalism, we do tend to... Now, legalists all have different standards. They all read the same law and come up with different standards, don't they? One, one person stresses one point, another person stresses another point. One person will gladly do one thing. He'll, he'll swallow a net and, and um, you know, 
has a go again he'll swallow a camel and uh, strain on that and swallow a camel right <laughs> in, other, in other words uh, different emphases are all, legalists always place different emphases on different points according to what they think and I've seen it happen clear across America here's one group that will stress you've got to wear the clothes of 1870 or 1890 to get around with bonnets and long dresses and exact reproductions of 1890 dress and another, another group over the next hill will ignore that aspect completely and be, they'll be all uh, heavy on some special food that you should eat and so they vary from person to person so the, the kind of food which I look for in my own life is not so much a meticulous obedience of, of what I eat and drink and how I dress I'm much more concerned about finding the graces of the Spirit love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness and so forth when I see that in my life that to me is a much, is much more important evidence now uh, when, when I come to answer these questions later in the day I'll be making the point that um, to me living healthfully is, is studying the laws of health and diet and so forth to enable me to be the most efficient and healthy and strong I can be to do the work God's given me to do and I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned about little rules and regulations in that respect